Welcome to the Every Nation Dorado Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message. Hi everyone. Welcome to our online uh, broadcast. It's uh, good to be with you on this glorious, on this day. Um, I trust and believe that the Lord has been gracious to you. Um, today, we are continuing with our sermon series on overcoming temptation. And the objective of this series is to empower believers to overcome and win against temptation. This is a four-part uh, sermon series. In the beginning, we started with temptation that is common to men. And in that, we got an assurance from the Lord that there is no temptation that has overtaken men or that is too hard for men to bear. We are able to endure because every time temptation comes, there is always an escape door. And in the second sermon, Pastor Chris was very elaborate on bread and sex. Um, what we say there, the key was to master our bodies and that our bodies should be our servants and an object or an instrument of worship unto our God. This morning, we'll be dealing with pride and then we will end off this series with riches and kingdoms. So what are we talking about pride? When we're looking at pride, uh, we must realize this is a very silent, it's a very stealth, a very subtle sin, the sin of pride and presumption. It is because it is very difficult to see. And uh, I will start here with a warning that we get from 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 16, which says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from this world. And uh, as we go further, I just want to let you in on a cheat code. Uh, only gamers may understand what a cheat code is. We find this in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, which says, No temptation has overtaken you. That is not common to men. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he also will provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure. Isn't that awesome? Our God is good. Let's start here by looking at the definition of what pride is. Pride is basically a feeling or a deep pleasure of satisfaction that you derive from your own achievement or that you derive from the achievements of those that are closer to you or from the qualities or possessions that are world widely uh, admired. Uh, I beg the pardon. Me. The common one is this. Too high an opinion of one's own ability or worth. This is a feeling of being better than others or a consciousness of one's dignity. This is where we find people or the phrase that says, swallow your pride and ask uh, your help. I'll tell you a little story uh, which I titled here, my story of the dunes and the Land Rover. Um, now back in the days uh, when I was still a youngster, a friend of mine bought a Land Rover, that was a Discovery too. And at the time I was driving my humble Corolla. And uh, being an adventurer uh, as I am, we set out to go try this Discovery, uh, this Land Rover in the dunes. And we set off for Swakopmund uh, with his family and my family. So while we were there, uh, just having fun, we decided to scale some of the dunes that was close by. So what happened is we eventually obviously got stuck in the sand and we struggled to get to dig out that Land Rover. Uh, we pushed all the buttons we needed to push. We pushed, uh, I mean, pulled all the gears that we needed to pull. That guy was not just leaving the sand that he was stuck in. And then uh, my friend's wife and my wife came with very wise counsel and they said, those two guys under that tree, they live here in the desert. Go to them and ask for help. They will help you out. But um, we were so proud. We reminded our wives that where we come from, we are used to the sand. 
We are used to the mud. We even cross rivers. So this is nothing we are getting out of here. So we spend a lot of time trying to get that Land Rover out. Eventually, we swallowed our pride and we went to ask for help. I can't really remember. Probably we would have, we, I think we asked one of our wives to say, go and ask for help from those guys there. And when those two gentlemen came, they came and the friend told the other guy, take 25. And we were wondering, what is 25? Uh, only to realize they were deflating the tires. And after deflating the tires, the guy jumped in the Land Rover and reversed it up the dune. Oh my goodness, we were dumbfounded. And that is that one point that you realize that had I done this, we would have been in there only for five minutes. So that's what pride looks like. We were too highly opinionated about what we thought we knew, but this was a foreign land or the foreign ground that we needed to uh, learn something. So pride is basically giving ourselves the credit for something that God has accomplished, taking the glory that belongs to God and keeping it for ourselves. And we see here there's three different kinds of pride that we, I want us to look at. That is the pride that God hates. We find that in Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13. And the pride we can feel about a job well done. Galatians chapter 6, verse 4 here says, But let each one, let his own work, test his own work, and then his reason to boss will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. We see here even in the creation of the earth, God created the heaven and the earth. And at every point, he looked back and he said, it was good. When he looked at mankind, he says, it was very good. So what we realize is, it's a sense of accomplishment. Um, this is the second level of pride I want us to, to look at. And the third is the pride we express over the accomplishment of our loved ones. We see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 4. And this is the kind of pride that you feel when your loved ones or those that are close to you have accomplished something. Like, for example, um, an achievement in sport where your child has done uh, a, a marvelous, uh, um, uh, for example, good time on the track field. Or this is when your child is of good behavior in school. We feel that pride. But I want us to focus on the pride that God hates. And that is the pride that leads to sin, which leads us to be separated from God and which eventually leads to death. As scripture says, the wages of sin is death and it's our sin that separates us from the love of God. So point number one here, we're looking at pride and presumption. And under pride and presumption, We'll deal with the source of pride, and then we'll look at pride and presumption uh, uh, itself. So pride is the first and the worst sin. Why do I say so? We see here that in, in heaven, um, it was not immorality. It was not the sin of bribery. It was not thieving, not even murder, but it was pride that led Satan to rebel against God. Pride starts on the inside and it manifests itself on the outside. And when I say on the inside, it also means it can stem from anything that God has given us, that God has put inside of us. Um, that's why it is very subtle. That's why it's easy to move into the areas of feel, of feeling like you can do it all, of feeling like you are all that. So let's look here at some examples where pride can come from. In the area of education and career, when you are excellent in your education, or when you have collected all the educational accolades, or you are there in high government offices, or in high corporate uh, uh, positions, it is potential for pride to creep in. In the area of finances and wealth, um, we often forget that God gives us the ability to create wealth, which we find in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20. But if you have possessions 
it's very easy to move into the areas of uh, uh, pride. Government schools and corporates, they often use awards to fuel pride. They use these to fuel ambitions and rivalry, and also to fuel the love of honor to achieve greater things. So there is absolutely nothing wrong with all these, but we need to check the motivation of our hearts while we do this. When it comes to performance at work, for example, it is not the time that we have to look down on people that are performing less than we are performing. But scripture tells us that we must do everything as unto the Lord. And in the area of religion, my goodness, this is the big one. It can be the ability to discern or the ability to prophesy especially to prophesy with eloquence and with uh, clarity and accuracy. It can also stem from the way you serve in the house of the Lord, in the church. I was reminded here about Solomon. What distinguished Solomon? He was given wisdom. And where did he get that wisdom? He got the wisdom from the Lord. I also reflected on Paul. Before he became Paul, he was zealous for house cleaning. That was to clean the house of the Lord. Um, here I want to add something as well. When we give our testimonies, how much of us is in those testimonies as compared to God? How much do we glorify God in our testimonies? So you see, there is always quite an inclination to include too much of ourselves while we're sharing our testimony than to reflect the glory back to God. So we see that pride can basically come from anywhere, even the fruits of the Spirit. What is it that you have that you have not received? We may ask that question. The antidote to all this is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. And it reads, everything that we have, right thinking and right living, a clean slate, and a fresh start comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. This means we have to deflect the glory to the author of all things, the perfecter of all things, and to the finisher of all things. To him be their glory. And King Solomon said it burst here in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. He says, above all else, guard your heart. For it is the wellspring of life. So our life flows from our hearts. Amen. Lucifer, on the other hand, did the opposite. The first scene, which is pride, was found in his heart. And this is the scene that first took place. It didn't take place on the earth. It happened in the heavens. And it was not by a human, by but by an angelic being. Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 11 to 17, gives us an indication of what happened here. What we see uh, with Lucifer, who was the guardian cherub, or the angel of the Lord, is that pride was found in his height. Let's see how Ezekiel described this. From verse 11, Son of man, sing this funeral song for the king of Tyre. Give him this message from the Sovereign Lord. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and exquisite in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Your clothing was adorned with every precious stone, red carnelian, pearl green peridot, white moonstone, blue green beryl, onyx, green jasper, blue lapis lazuli, turquoise and emerald all beautifully crafted for you and set in the finest gold. They were given to you on the day you were created. I ordained and anointed you as the mighty angelic guardian. You had access to the holy mountain of God and walked among the stones of fire. You were blameless in all you did from the day you were created until the day evil was found in you. You reach, your rich comments led you to violence and you sinned. So I banished you in disgrace from the mountain of God. I expelled you, almighty guardian, 
from your place among the stones of fire. Your heart was filled with pride. Your heart was filled with pride because of all your beauty. Your wisdom was corrupted by your love of splendor. So I threw you to the ground and exposed you to the curious gaze of kings. What we see here is pride was an issue. The issue was the beauty. The issue was in his creation. I know there's this cliche that goes uh, around when you greet somebody, how are you? Um, um, in the name of prophesying or of being positive, we say, I'm beautifully and wonderfully made. I wonder how much that is really a response in terms of worship. So what we see in verse 12 is wisdom and beauty was the attributes of this cherub. Verse 13 says, he was even in the garden of God in Eden. So Satan, basically because of his splendor and his love for splendor, he became proudful. Let's remember here that he was not a god. He was not a human being, but was an angel. So if Satan could stand, as we read earlier, that temptation will come to every man. Every created being will face temptation, which basically means temptation is real. Even Jesus was tempted. Pride is enmity with God. Because when Satan rebelled, after he had started to reflect all this beauty, um, uh, all this splendor, when he, wa he started to take that in, he rebelled against God and he was banished from where he stood. So we see here in, in our Isaiah chapter 14, uh, verse 13 to 15, he explains it further and it says, For you said to yourself, I will ascend to heaven, and I will set my throne above God's stars. I will preside on the mountain of the gods far away in the north. I will climb to the highest heavens, and I will make myself like the Most High. Instead, you will be brought down to the place of the dead, down to its lowest depth. What happened? Satan was held down. He was stripped of the splendor that he had. He was stripped of the beauty that he had. He was stripped of the access that he had uh, in the place where God uh, dwelt. The motivation here was pride that was found in his heart. And the action that came forth from there is rebellion. This basically came from the inner will of Satan, set in position or in opposition to the Creator. We see the opposite of Jesus here, who though being fully God did not seek equality with God. Satan said, I will make myself like the Most High. The question we could ask ourselves is, here is, what is in our hearts? Are we able to identify all these I wills? Because when I look in Isaiah 14, what I see is five I wills. But how many I wills can we find in our own hearts? As read earlier, Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 says, Who, being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. That one right there is an antidote to kill pride. Right there, Jesus' humility not to count himself as equal to God is an antidote to kill pride in our hearts. The part B of that, we're talking about pride presumes. Pride will drive you to presume. It will drive you to presume on people. That means you will take people for granted. It will drive you to presume on God. That means you will think the same things that you did, the same grace that you had, you're still operating in the same grace, and it will lead you to deception. 
We look here at religious presumption. That is the presumption on God. And this happens when we take scripture out of context and we use it to justify ourselves. We do the things and after we've done everything, we ask God to come and bless it. Which is basically on an assumption that God still wants you to do the same thing and God will bless you the same way. It manipulates on behalf of my agenda. That's what presumption is. Because if we come to God with everything that we have already done and ask God to bless it, it's almost like saying, God, I don't need you, but just lay your hands here. Then I can move on. Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 to 23 says, On that day men will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. So the proud will always think, as I am doing this, I'm doing this in the name of the Lord. Had we gone back and asked God to say, what must I do? Where must I go? We remember Paul in his stories uh, that, we, that we read in his lifetime. He always said, I wanted to go there, but the Spirit of the Lord prevented me to. We see obedience coming through that he did not do what uh, God did not say he does. We see that as well in the life of Jesus. Jesus did not assume on God. But he always said, I can only do the things that I see my father do, and I can only say the things that I hear my father say. So Jesus was never presumptuous on his father. The proud will think like the Pharisee in Jesus' parable that we find in Luke chapter 18, and it reads, that is the Pharisee, he stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I pay tithe of all that I receive. So we see here that this Pharisee was proudful. And as proudful as he was, he was exalting himself. He was making himself think he was righteous before God, all in God's sight. The Pharisee obviously left that temple still not right with God because of the attitude or the pride that was in his heart. So what we see there is presumption and self-righteousness, which is deception in the end and is one of the things that drives us into ruin because we presume and we think God is with us. If we recall... Um, when the Israelites were, were moving in the desert, one of the things that uh, Moses said was, if you don't go, we are not going. So the, this is basically a prayer that says, unless God you move, only then we can move. Um, presumption and faith come very close and in most cases a very fine line and it is not so easy to separate that. The reason is that both of these concepts dwell on a feeling, on a feeling that I am on the right track. So it is important to know through the wisdom of God that there is a difference between presumption and faith. And the fundamental difference is this. Faith looks at the outward. It looks at God. It looks at uh, placing dependence and reliance on God. But presumption tends inward and looks at the confidence and the assurance in self. Just like the Pharisee says, I'm not like the other men, not even like this tax uh, collector. And the antidote to this is we look at what scripture says, we look at Jesus and we walk in step with the Spirit. Matthew chapter 5, uh, in the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, uh, verse 3, Scripture tells us that the humble, those that are poor in spirit, 
will inherit the kingdom of heaven. It's only humility that can earn us the right to be in the presence of God. Point number two, Satan wants God to resist you by making you proud. That is his whole agenda. The Bible says, the devil came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Pride is unique or is a unique sin because it is often so hard to see it in your own life, especially when you compare it to other sins. It is difficult to discern that I'm being proud for. And anything that God hates is sin. We read earlier in, in, in Proverbs that pride is sin and God hates it. So his tactic basically is to get you to thrive on the very thing that God has put in your heart, on the, on the very thing that God has blessed you with. That's what Satan wants to take, pervert, turn it around and make you turn against God and think, I got here by myself, I got here by my struggles, I got here by my own effort. And we asked a question earlier, we said, what is it that you have that you have not received? Everything that Satan had, we read in the book of uh, uh, Ezekiel, he had received from God. In creation, God had uh, made Satan that way. And that, instead of, the, of, of reflecting that worship to God, he reflected or he deflected and turned on that glory to himself. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, The devil is like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. In today's context, he uses pride to separate you and once you are on your own, destruction is on the way. We find that in Proverbs chapter 16, which says, Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. Pride, in the context of these verses, refers to an arrogant attitude that manifests itself in independence, in independence from God. So when you are full of pride, you will say you do not need God. And the antidote here is humility is the fear of the Lord. It is words are riches and honor and life. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 4 and the second part of John chapter 10 verse 10 says, Jesus came to give life and life to the fullest. This is the antidote to resist Pride. James chapter 4, verse 6 to 7 says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And verse 7, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. What we find here is, we first have to recognize that God hates pride. If he hates pride, pride he will resist you. And if he resists you, that is the separation we read earlier, in our first Peter chapter 5. That is the separation that the enemy wants to use to separate you from God. And once you are separated from God, he can then annihilate you. But if we resist him, as much as he can push everything that God has given us on us, try to influence us to reflect on ourselves, we must resist him. And he doesn't have the endurance to be resisted for too long. He will free, flee from you, the Bible declares. C.S. Lewis calls pride and he says, the complete anti-God state of mind, that is, I do not need God mentality. And the Bible says in Psalm chapter 10, verse 4, in his pride, the wicked does not seek him. In all his thoughts, there is no room for God. Because a proudful mind or a proudful heart cannot think that I need God. We find Paul saying, in Christ I can do all things because he strengthens me and his grace is sufficient. Because he recognizes, he comes to that point of recognizing that there is nothing I cannot do if it is not for the grace of the Lord. 
And as we go further here, we find uh, different warnings. Um, I'm not going to read the scriptures for the sake of time, but you may read in Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 32, Isaiah 28, verse 3, in Ezekiel chapter 31, verse 10 to 12, or Proverbs chapter 8, verse 13, or Obadiah chapter 1, verse 3 to 4. The proud one shall stumble and fall, with none to raise him up. And point number three, humility cures worldliness. Worldliness, worldliness. We need humility for worldliness to die. Humility is the greatest key for overcoming all temptations. And humility is a decision of the will. It's not an emotion. If the Bible tells us to humble ourselves, it requires us to make a decision and it requires us to express that decision in action. It literally means lowliness of mind. So we see that humility is a heart attitude. It's not merely an outward demeanor. If you walk in a room and you find somebody seated like this, you may think that person is humble. But that person may be kissing you to the face and say, look how they are dressed. Look at that. Look, they think they are all that. But in terms of their outward appearance, they may look like they are very, very humble. Humility is a heart attitude. The Bible describes humility as meekness, lowliness, and absence of self. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, uh, it reads, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Only those that are poor in spirit, only those that come to recognize that they need Jesus will inherit the kingdom of God. Those that recognize their sin and the need for a savior will inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus explains this further um, in this way. We find this in uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 7 um, to 11. When Jesus noticed that all who had come to the dinner were trying to sit in the seats of honor near the head of the table, he gave them this advice. Jesus was talking to his disciples. When you are invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the seat of honor. What if someone who is more distinguished than you has also been invited to that party, to that wedding, to that meeting? The host will come and say, give this person your seat. Then you will be embarrassed and you will have to take whatever seat is left at the foot of the table. Verse 10, instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, friend, we have, a, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all other guests. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. I told you about our self-exaltation um, that was claiming that we know how to deal with sand, but we were humbled by the sand and we were humbled by our wives by swallowing our pride swallowing our ego and go ask for help from another man amen let's ask for help we see here also uh, in matthew chapter 23 verse 12 so what is biblical humility i have three points here that i'll share with you what biblical humility is Biblical humility is complete dependence on God. Luke chapter 18, verse 13, which is the uh, following the Pharisee. Here we see the tax collector also pray. And it says, but the tax collector standing far off would not even lift up his eyes to the heaven. He was beating his chest saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, that is the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And everyone who humbles himself will be exalted. To be humble is to be aware of your own sin and unworthiness. 
and surrender yourself to the mercy of God. That is what biblical humility looks like. Number two, you are not concerned for power, position, or honor. Luke chapter 10, chapter 14, verse 10 says, Instead, take the lowest place at the foot of the table. Then when your host sees you, he will come and say, Friend, we have a better place for you. Then you will be honored in front of all other guests. And Matthew 23, verse 8 says, Don't let anyone call you rabbi, for you have only one teacher. And all of you are equal as brothers and sisters. And don't address anyone here on earth as father, for only God in heaven is your father. And don't let anyone call you teacher, for you have only one teacher, the Messiah. The greatest among you must be a servant, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Since Jesus was talking to, disciple, to his disciples, he was warning them against the man of God mentality. As preachers, as pastors, as evangelists, as prophets, deacons, elders, ministry leaders, whatever position we find ourselves in the house of God, we must be very careful on how people treat us, as this may move our hearts into the areas of pride, and we may begin to do things out of our own selfish ambitions. We may begin to manipulate people. We may begin to use the word of God to justify why we do or why we say certain things, which is presumption. Amen? It may also apply to our corporate and social statuses. We must be very careful of the way we let people treat us or the way they think about us, about our status, it may easily move our hearts into the areas of pride. I remember once I was still a youngster then, um, uh, early on in the Lord, I had just given my life to the Lord. I went to attend a victory encounter. And at this encounter, I was paired with another man, a very older man I would call my father. And uh, at this encounter, we had to confess our issues uh to one another and for me as young as i am obviously i didn't have a lot to confess it was a small swear word here and a small uh, uh, uh lustful look here uh but as this man started to share i felt very little and i felt uh, uh that i still really have a long way to go when it comes to life just listening to how far and how much this man has been hurt. This man has uh, swayed away from the Lord and so on. So it was incredible. His humility to look this young child in the face and tell him this deep stuff. It was incredible. So I believe he got his freedom that weekend. And shortly after that, he signed up to serve in the church. And he was assigned to my team. I was a team leader then as an usher. And this man, I would send him and say, align these chairs. I would send him back and say, realign those chairs. Never once did he give me this, do you know who I am demeanor? Never once. But this man was a CEO of a very big company in Namibia. So to be humble is to disregard prestige or rank. Number three, this is the big one. Biblical humility is obedience to God's word. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, I'll read it again. Who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. So we see that to be humble is to acknowledge God as Lord and to obey him as a servant. This is what Jesus, even what Jesus did, even to the point of death. Isaiah 66 verse 2 says, 
My hands made both heaven and the earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I bless those who have humble and contrite hearts, who tremble at my word. And Galatians chapter 2 verse 20 says, The life we now live, we live by faith in the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. That is true humility. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 6 says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up. We read in the Gospels that if you exalt yourself, you will be humbled. And if you humble yourself, you will be exalted. Biblical humility is obedience to God. If God says go, you go. It doesn't matter what you have, the possessions that you have, the size of your bank account, it doesn't matter. If God says you go, you go. Amen? And as we conclude, let we be reminded, let's not be proud and be presumptuous. Let us not allow certain to turn us away from God, our Creator, who has given us everything that we have. The Bible also says that He has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So let us not portray our godliness as though it is our own effort, but humble ourselves and know that this all comes from God. I'm able to do this because Christ strengthens me. Let us be humble, which is the ultimate cure and the key to access the grace and the mercy of God. The proud person pursues his or her own way, but the humble one obeys God's word, delighting in the Lord and humbly following his commands makes us sure-footed. It makes us stand on a firm foundation. It makes us not sleep. It makes us not stagger. It prevents us from going into ruin and destruction. The Lord makes firm the steps of the one who delights in him. Humility and fear of the Lord establishes us securely on God's path, where our feet won't stumble, nor will we fall. How can we resist pride? Here is some key um, uh, elements that we can use daily to resist pride. Humility daily in prayer, saving others, denying yourself and being generous, forgiving and refusing to take revenge, and daily repentance in the word. Amen? I believe that as we allow God to be God, as we, not like Satan, try to usurp or to take the authority of Scripture for ourselves, God will exalt us in due time. Amen. God bless you and uh, may he keep you and may he provide that way of escape when a temptation comes, especially the subtle temptation of pride. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I bless your people this morning. I speak the word of God over their lives. I speak that their hearts are saturated with who you are, the revelation of who you are. Lord God, that may we not be found to be walking in the uh, 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 areas of pride, that we may be found uh, in humility to the God that we serve. May you humble us, God. May you keep us watching our own hearts. May we guard our hearts from deceitfulness in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you for listening. 
For more information about this podcast and other resources, please visit envintook.org.